Welcome to Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Ron Kramer from the Department of Sociology at Western Michigan University, and I serve as the host for the program. Uh, today with me is one of our regular viewmeisters, uh, Denise Keel. Uh, Denise is a professor in the Political Science Department at Western Michigan University. She's also affiliated with the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Did I get it right? You got it perfect. And Denise also serves in a very important role. She's the chair of our Climate Change Working Group on mm -hmm. campus. Also joining us today as a special guest is Ed Martini. Ed is from the Department of History at Western Michigan University, and he moonlights as an administrator. <laughs> He's the Associate Dean of Extended University Programs. Mm -hmm. And we have a very, very special guest with us today, uh, Professor Christian Appy from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, Dr. Appy has uh, recently published a very important book, uh, one of the best books uh, I've read on Vietnam. It's called American Reckoning, The Vietnam War and Our National Identity. There it is up on the screen. Outstanding book. I really, really enjoyed reading your Thanks. book. Yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. going back over it again in preparation for your mm -hmm. visit today, I was like, oh, wow. I, yeah. I even I missed a lot of stuff the first time yeah. through this. Really great to go back. So welcome to Kalamazoo. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Thanks. Chris is speaking uh, at Western Michigan University, uh, giving the Winnie Veenstra Peace sure. Lecture, so we're very happy to have him. And you also published a piece in the New York Times earlier mm -hmm. this week on Vietnam, which I thought was very interesting. And you, you raised a question, what was the Vietnam War about? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very important question because as you point out in the viewpoint column, it profoundly shapes our memory of the war, the meanings that we give to it, and the ongoing significance uh, right. of this particular war on our national identity and our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. so, so what was the war all about? <laughs> well, you know, there's no faster way to get to the heart of those you know, bitter debates and controversies of the war years and, and to, on to the present in terms of trying to mm -hmm. define what the war was about and its meaning and significance. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's, it's a complicated question, but basically I think there are two fundamental frameworks for uh, interpreting the war. One is a kind of a Cold, a cold mm -hmm. War framework mm -hmm. where, the, where the war is seen as a, 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 a battle between East and West, between communism and democracy or the free world, as our presidents would say. Mm -hmm. You know, we might think mm -hmm. of it as, you know, capitalism or some other construct. But yeah, Cold War, a Cold War conflict. Uh, but that really leaves out a large portion of the world. In, in fact, from the perspective of uh, many of the, certainly the perspective of the Vietnamese victors who triumphed in the mm -hmm. end, they had an anti-colonial framework right. for mm -hmm. understanding the war. They, they saw the warfare against the American-backed government, Saigon, and the United States as a as sort of a, continu a continuation of a much longer struggle you know, mm -hmm. uh, against the French before the Americans. And the fact that the United States had supported the French in the French Indochina War, yeah. or, the, or the first uh, Indochina War, um, makes it unsurprising that so many Vietnamese would see us as a, a new form of uh, colonial power. Maybe not uh, the old fashioned kind that mm -hmm. wants to rule directly, but a kind of neo colonial power that wants to have it. Uh, uh, have put someone in place that will kind of uh, serve American interests yeah. by proxy. So those are the two kind of, uh, you know, uh, frameworks or paradigms for understanding it. And I, I, I think, um, honestly, that the anti-colonial, what I, in this op-ed thing mm -hmm. in the Times, I try to make the case that I think the, the anti-colonial uh, framework um, has more to teach us about how the war actually played out uh, and, 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 and why it ended the way it, it did. Yeah which isn't, though the Cold War framework does certainly help us understand and explain the um, in, uh, American policy makers mm -hmm. and their view of the war mm -hmm. uh, and their, their, their and, and misunderstanding of much right. of the war, in fact. Um, and then there's, of course, a more another sort of way of looking at the war, which is just that it was, m was primarily at core a Vietnamese civil war that somehow got internationalized by these outside mm -hmm. Powers, mm -hmm. including the Soviet Union and China mm -hmm. and Australia and South uh, Korea. But, you know, in response to that, I would say who was the biggest foreign presence in Vietnam, the most consequential one, mm -hmm. who's the one that actually mm -hmm. dropped 8 million tons of bombs uh, on Southeast mm -hmm. Asia and, and deployed millions of troops? It was, it was the United States. So, in that sense, um, I, I don't uh, I see it as primarily at core civil war. I see it as. Uh, 
this, uh, that, that the United States was acting as a kind of counter-revolutionary power mm -hmm. that then really exacerbated local internal divisions in Vietnam, which were certainly there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, I hope that's not too complicated, but it is a trick. No, like, <laughs> no. no, but again, and I think a lot of Americans don't have an appreciation for that larger history, that larger right. context, that they forget about the French being there. They yeah. forget that we, in a sense. Yeah, that we somehow came in, and this is certainly the way uh, Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles, the Secretary mm -hmm. of State right. at the time, thought they were coming in with untainted Yes. Um, by the stigma of colonialism, yeah. that we're Americans, we're going in with clean hands, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they know that we don't really want anything for ourselves, uh, and that the Vietnamese will welcome us. So that, that obviously... Yeah. And the fact is wrong. that th this division between North and South Vietnam is a historical creation at this period of time, right? I mean, there was no... I mean, there were certainly uh, differences uh, um, among yes, people Yes, that's who crucial, lived in that area. crucial, there wasn't a, crucial, a crucial fact that you know, uh, you know, if you listen to, to the, our presidents during this whole period, mm -hmm. you would you would assume that this this was a clear cut uh, invasion of uh, communist aggression right. mm -hmm. against a sovereign, independent nation of South Vietnam, as if they, they, they had always existed as separate entities. In fact, they, they were never intended to be separate countries. The Geneva Accords of 1954 that, that uh, partitioned the North and the South was intended to be simply a temporary division that would be followed in just two years' time with a nationwide election you know, that would put into place a, a single leader for all of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, American intelligence and South Vietnamese intelligence knew with a certainty that uh, Ho Chi Minh the communist mm -hmm. leader uh, of the North would would win uh, nationwide. That he would he had broad support in the South as well as uh, in mm -hmm. the North. So, uh, yeah, that that proved to be one of the things that the anti-war movement uh, seized on as a blatant example of an American mm -hmm. falsehood. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in trying to create this uh, narrative to justify American intervention. Mm -hmm. That yeah. there were there were pockets of anti-colonial and anti-American and anti-South Vietnamese government resistance all o over the South in every pro province. I mean, yeah. um, I said in this piece, you know, one thing that I think it might help Americans try to under understand the war, if, if, if our own civil war mm -hmm. in this country bore mm -hmm. some resemblance mm -hmm. to the war as it uh, was in Vietnam, you'd have to imagine mm -hmm. that the biggest superpower in the world, let's say Great Britain, had encouraged the South to secede uh, and then uh, armed it to the max with the greatest navy in the world from offshore and then the huge numbers of, of uh, British mm -hmm. soldiers. You'd also have to imagine that in every southern state there were um, major pockets of pro-Union uh, uh, Southerners who were taking up arms uh, yeah. against the Confederacy. And then, then uh, so if, if somehow the Union still did prevail with all of that, despite all that British support, what would the war be called? I don't think it would be called a civil war. I think it would be called maybe the second um, war of Independence, right. or if you count War of 1812, maybe the Third <laughs> War of third Independence. War, exactly. Uh, you know, who knows? African Americans might think of it as the First War of Liberation, but mm. probably only yeah. the Confederates and maybe the British would say oh, it was a civil, it was a civil yes. war. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's it's very interesting to me. I uh, definitely, when I was growing up, still in the late 70s, early 80s, learned the noble struggle moral uh, argument was the one that was still put forth and. The most interesting thing to me, thinking about national identity, when I've read Ed's book and have gotten to know your work a little bit, is how long some of the falsehoods went on within the administrations, especially as a political scientist, that the rhetoric of more bombing and you know just, just ignoring evidence to the contrary. And, and do you find that evidence to be the same with continuing to put out the rhetoric of this is the moral struggle against the communists? I mean, we knew that mm -hmm. Hanoi wasn't backed by China and Russia at some pretty early point. Yeah, you mean, I mean, there's the coups, there's all these things that happened very, very early, yeah. um, yet we maintain our storyline. And that has always been Well, the noble cause, that, that you know, yeah. view of the war, that it was a noble struggle against communism that should have been fought and could have been exactly. won if we had done X, Y, and exactly. or Z yeah. differently, st certainly still exist in our yeah. culture. Yeah. And President Ronald Reagan shared yes. that view, but I, I guess I think that that's a minority view. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think if there is such a thing as a dominant American uh, memory of the war, 
it is, uh, well, it's the kind of thing we saw in the, the Ken Burns documentary, yeah. that it was a kind of tragic uh, intervention. Well, uh, it, it, you know, it, that we was, Vietnam was not a, really a threat to our mm -hmm. national security, and that we have good intentions, mm. you know, going in there to try to mm -hmm. help them, but we didn't really, uh, it was kind of bungled into it, mm -hmm. and, and sort of stepped into a, an alien world, into this quagmire, and we got deeper and deeper, and mm -hmm. it was, you know, uh, Rather than that, that actually yeah. this was a very purposeful assertion yeah. of a kind of imperial power that began with support to the French. And yeah. then mm -hmm. in spite of evidence that things weren't going on, right. as that's, you say, we continued to pile on thinking that every country or every uh, cause uh, ulti ha has a, a breaking point. They must if we just drop more bombs mm -hmm. or... Uh, you know, more Agent Orange mm -hmm. or patrol more aggressively. Yeah. Though, in fact, the, uh, that really um, had, uh, I would argue, an opposite effect. That's right. that the, more, the more brutally we, we waged and the more indiscriminately we bombed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and this, we have parallels to the w global war on terror That's in right. the 21st century. The, exactly. You know, uh, how many more terrorists are you creating uh, yeah. by um, approaching it as a war rather than mm -hmm. maybe a police action or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, have, I have a question for both of you. When you teach about Vietnam today with our current students, yeah. what do they bring? What, what kind of a, a perspective do they bring to the classroom, mm -hmm. Ed? When you're teaching here at Western about Vietnam, do they know much about the war? Do they even get to exactly. Vietnam yeah. in their history yeah, yeah. classes yeah, in high school? They uh, do a little bit better job okay. than they yeah. did when we were growing up. Yeah. But it's still for, I think it's a mixed bag. For most of the students, it's it's ancient history. It might as well be World War One or World <laughs> War Two. It's pretty far in the past. But well, I still you. find pretty regularly that there's students that have, you know, yeah. it's getting to be grandfathers, you know, as opposed to my dad. Or right. But some still have uncles. I mean, some usually have some kind of, at That's least right. a Western, some kind of a family connection where they know somebody who was in the war. They know somebody who knows somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, regardless of that, they tend to still be very interested in it. It's mm -hmm. still, I mean, I don't know, I imagine your classes are the same way. Yeah. I could offer that class tomorrow and it'll fill. Students are super interested mm -hmm. to learn about Vietnam. They understand that it's a really important lens through which we view the current wars, mm -hmm. we talk about Iraq, about whether or not it's like Vietnam or not. Mm -hmm. So they, they are interested in that time period and, and in learning more about it, but they don't bring a lot of knowledge to the mm -hmm. table. They bring some of these popular yeah. ideas that they've picked up from popular culture and popular discourse, yeah. but they don't know anything, which is not surprising because very few Americans know yeah, anything about it's the interesting. war. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, someday somebody will do an interesting study on how generation after generation has... Here's these stories. Because there was a period, I think, mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s when a lot of the more troubling images from the war were scrubbed from the high school That's textbooks. That's absolutely mm -hmm. right. But they would, of course, see them somewhere in the mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the famous picture of a Buddhist monk immolating right. himself was the cover of Rage Against the Machine yeah. CD mm -hmm. back in the early 90s. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is they, they wouldn't necessarily know what it means. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, there's a historian who, giving lectures at college campuses, would show some of those famous, uh, disturbing photographs, inc including the, the street corner assassination yes. of, a, of a, a Viet Cong prisoner with his hands tied behind mm -hmm. his back. You know that mm -hmm. sort of pistol, the girl pistol to the, the and the, 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 the nine-year-old right. girl running naked. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, this historian would uh, say, how many to college students, how many of you have seen this photograph? And most hands would go up. Mm -hmm. And then he'd say, okay, well, in this case, with the, uh, the street corner um, killing, uh, who was the shooter? Mm. Mm. And he found that something like two-thirds of the students, this is in the 90s, uh, thought it was a communist uh, agent that was shooting uh, wow. a South Vietnamese. And it was, of course, the reverse. Yeah. It was the chief of the South Vietnamese uh, Huh. national police who, um, doing the shooting, our allies. So yes. one of the reasons that was so disturbing to the you know, Americans at the time is it was yet more evidence that um, m maybe we've allied ourselves with a government that uh, isn't actually mm -hmm. uh, a uh, supporter of hu human rights and mm -hmm. freedom and democracy, all those claims that have been made. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the, one of the most interesting things that I kind of relearned in your New York op-ed piece, I think it's from the Ellsberg, uh, but you yes, know, we're not, yeah. the, we're not on the wrong side, we are right, right. <laughs> the wrong side. Right. Well, what um, I think it really meant there, this came from the documentary Hearts and Minds, yes. is that if the United States had not intervened in 1954, yeah. uh, it's not likely that there would have been a, a nation called South Vietnam, or, or at least not one that would have survived for very long, mm -hmm. given all the internal divisions and mm -hmm. the support that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the um, 
the mm -hmm. anti-French movement right. had, had generated. They were the real patriots and heroes of that uh, country. Right. Um, so uh, the, 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 American, uh, the American intervention was so decisive. Mm -hmm. And, that, this, the, and the, the, really the galling part of it was, there's so many galling parts, but it was done in the name of self-determination. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we we're going to go in to bring self-determination when we're determining just about everything. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that issue of uh, Vietnamese nationalism, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's completely overlooked. Mm -hmm. and of course, especially in the Cold War, a frame that you talk about yeah, right. uh, what was Ho Chi Minh trying to achieve when you know was he yeah, just a right. puppet of China and, and Russia or was there something larger going on there and of course that larger issue of Vietnamese nationalism I think it's completely right. written out yeah. or overlooked. And a few people in government did ultimately recognize that uh, their assumptions about uh, a kind of mm -hmm. monolithic uh, communism controlled from mm -hmm. uh, uh, from Iran. Moscow or Beijing was was wrong and that the domino theory uh, yeah. was a false theory, but uh, this I'm thinking of McNamara was at least oh, one yes. of them so that admitted mm -hmm. that. But, yes. mm -hmm. um, you know, once they, once they started to doubt the, um, the justifications that they had used publicly and still used publicly to defend the war, the thing that, mm -hmm. that raises this question, why did they then persist? Why, yes, that's you have to, what why not just, you know, uh, admit that it wasn't exactly. working and mm -hmm. withdraw? And that's where I think you really have to turn to arguments about, um, uh, well, uh, how they define credibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's what they say: our national credibility is on the line. We've mm -hmm. made a commitment here. If we pull out, we're going to be seen as weak. Mm -hmm. And here's where sort of gender analysis uh, is very important, as uh, really even as a causal mm -hmm. explanation. Mm -hmm. I think these guys really, you know, in addition to not wanting to um, concede, be accused of national defeat, that this would be terrible for blow to American prestige, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to be the first president to lose a war yeah. because they didn't want to be seen as weak personally. Right. They, mm -hmm. you know, LBJ in his retirement talked about it explicitly in yes. those terms. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be seen as this, you know, the, I would have been seen as a spineless yeah. man, an unmanly man. This was my nightmare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the war is pursued and, and in your book, American Reckoning, you talk about the effect that it has on national identity. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a war that's carried out under false pretexts. The American people are systematically lied to. It's an incredibly brutal war. Mm -hmm. uh, there are atrocities committed by American troops. You mentioned the bombing. Uh, what was it? Three million Vietnamese were killed, uh, about half of them civilians, yeah. I think you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, the stubborn refusal to withdraw from LBJ on then on into the Nixon administration. And again, this is, I think you put it, the stunning failure to achieve any of our objectives. Mm -hmm. This all had a, an enormous effect on our national identity. It did, you know, basically blew it up to yeah. some extent. Yeah. And uh, so talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. national identity yeah. and the effect that the war had on, on that identity. And I think that leads us yeah. into the issue of well, American Well, my, my view is that no other event mm -hmm. in our history so mm -hmm. fundamentally undermined the once broad faith in American exceptionalism, this idea yeah. that, you know, uh, we're the good guys of history. That's we right. are mm -hmm. the, uh, the greatest country in the world, that we are superior in our values and our institutions and mm -hmm. um, our, um, that, and, and on top of which we are always invincible. <laughs> and that, right. I mean, that faith goes back throughout our history, but I think it kind mm -hmm. of had its heyday uh, understandably, uh, during and after World War II, mm -hmm. where we came out of that uh, that uh, enormously costly war um, in better shape than any by far than Thank any country in the in the world. So, um, you know, uh, in those days, and I was just a, you know a little kid in the heyday of that, and we never had to chant, we never chanted USA, 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 because you didn't have to. We just assumed, of course, <laughs> we're number one. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> that, that all comes into question. Yes. And it's not just the Vietnam War, obviously. This is the 60s. So you have the civil rights right. movement and the development of the women's movement and uh, environmental movement, right. and all gay rights changes. movement, so, you, yep. know, you name it. And all of them are, be, are raising fundamental questions about who are we? It's a kind of mm -hmm. national, so, you know, soul searching, mm -hmm. you know, kind of an identity cri national identity crisis, but also an awakening, an, a major awakening to... Uh, yeah. you know, uh, self-critical analysis, you know, how have we acted not only in Vietnam, but, you know, historically. And um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, by the end of the war, 
um, I, would, I would argue that a, a majority of Americans are not just uh, opposed to the war, but uh, have some fundamental doubts about uh, mm -hmm. American exceptionalism. You know, even pro yeah. even pro war uh, supporters, the ho hawks in this country, uh, were themselves uh, pulling their ha hair out, thinking, yeah. uh, "How could the greatest nation in the world, who had you know performed so magnificently in defeating fascism, get defeated by a country of rice farmers? You know, right. what's happened? And you know, how could we be so divided?" And and mm -hmm. and so even even they had major doubts about. Uh, American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know. So some people thought it was bad that we were we were losing that faith, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other people thought it was it, it was it was great. You know that mm -hmm. that's what we we needed. So we mm -hmm. sort of re redemptive, and and yeah. it, it's mm -hmm. one way of maybe we can stop having you know wars like this. And mm -hmm. this is this is my view. But unfortunately, in the decades after the war, I do think that the um, the right wing in particular right. um, was very successful in, in cobbling back together, you know, like Humpty Dumpty, yes. mm -hmm. all its broken pieces, this sort of new version of American exceptionalism, which, which is different. And I'm not saying that the earlier version was better. I think uh, both of them, mm -hmm. you know, have acted in very imperial and aggressive uh, uh, ways, mm -hmm. dangerous ways. But the, the, more, the current model seems to be I think much less confident, much more defensive, less yes. idealistic. It doesn't have that kind of, you know, right. um, new frontier, Peace Corps, K Kennedy era idealism. Mm -hmm. It's much mm -hmm. more uh, bombastic and, and, and mm -hmm. kind of bitter and xenophobic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, let's build walls. And, right. uh, America's you know, right. that we're in a sense of victimhood, America's you know, national right. victimhood, yeah. that, right. that we're the victim of yeah. these mysterious mm -hmm. foreign forces that mm -hmm. are kind of don't understand that we're the greatest country mm -hmm. in the world. Right. Yeah, you know, if you go back to the when we were. Yeah younger that, I mean, I still remember, and I, I think I talked about this the last time we had that yeah, on, yeah. and uh, when I was a kid growing up, I had this little book with one of those little golden books, you know, and it was all about American wars. And of course, the main theme was we'd never lost a war, right. never mm -hmm. lost a war. And we always fought wars for only the best purposes, mm -hmm. right? And so I just remember that was something I just completely absorbed right. and mm -hmm. believed in. Uh, I, I totally, yeah. you know, bought into this American exceptionalism and the fact that we had never lost a war and we only fought so for did I. I remember being a little kid and berating my parents for not listening to Kennedy who was on TV. You know, they were <laughs> chit-chatting in the background. I said, it's the president. Yeah. I mean, the, the reverence for the president, yes. the office of the presidency. I mean, yeah. he was an unusually charismatic one, but it yeah. didn't matter. He was the president, you know. But, but yeah. then, but what changed then was Vietnam. Yes. For me, yeah. personally, it was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still can remember uh, early years in college, the there's a song by the Guess Who, American Woman. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's that line in there, you know, American woman, you know, get away. We don't need your war machine. Yeah. We don't need your yeah. ghetto scenes. And boy, yeah. Yeah. that just really resonated with me. Like, yeah. yeah, my yeah. country, you right. know, it's this racist country. We've got this civil rights movement going on. And yeah. we're fighting this war and we've got this war machine. And anything, if, if anything helped to transform my own political consciousness, it was mm -hmm. that kind of a perspective. And mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. most of that was triggered by coming to grips with the war. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of Americans experience exactly what you're talking about here, this crisis That's of right. the national identity. Mm -hmm. Just it was very personal for most of us. Yeah. Why the students are still so interested, I think, as you were saying, mm -hmm. in yeah. that era, and why there's, you know, every documentary is still about the 60s and about this time, mm -hmm. because we're still struggling yeah. with those questions, as you say. I, that are a little bit more um, engaged in a political way with oh, yeah. than maybe 10 years ago. Absolutely. I think, you know, in, yeah. the, in the immediate wake of 9-11, right. I mean, the, 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 the state propaganda was so intense and, mm -hmm. and you know, effective uh, largely. Mm -hmm. Now yeah, I think yeah. students are, are shockable again, yeah. you know, uh, and they, when, when you tell them about the My Lai Massacre, you know, they really yeah. don't know the details yeah. and, mm -hmm. and they're going, wow, you know. Because that's that was the in '69 when it was revealed. It, it it was while there was an initial effort to deny it. A lot of Americans said this couldn't we be our boys. Be. This has right. to be these photos have to be mm -hmm. fake or the, mm -hmm. maybe the Viet Cong did it. But eventually, it was in there were, the evidence was incontrovertible. So people had mm -hmm. to come to terms with it. Yeah. And you know it it uh, you know for people in the anti-war movement, it, it was largely confirmation of things that they they already thought were going on right. and. Uh, but for more moderate people, it, it really did, I think, introduce mm -hmm. a moral critique of the war that came on the heels of a, of a critique that was more pragmatic, but was already strongly there. We don't seem to be winning. Mm -hmm. It's costing a hell of a lot of money. We're losing a lot yeah. of American lives. But now on top of it, 
uh, you know, we may be acting in this reprehensible way. Right, right. And then, you know, for people who still tried to defend it, you know, one of the most common defenses was, well, in war, all sides do this sort of thing. Right. It's, mm -hmm. in, it's inevitable. And, you know, what I find interesting about that argument is if you, even if you concede that that's true, you know, what is the, uh, you've sort of thrown American exceptionalism out the, mm -hmm. the window by mm -hmm. making that argument. Because mm -hmm. if we're, if we're, have the same exactly. capacity for evil as other nations, then, you know, and, and we now agree on that, that that's, that's uh, healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was another uh, response that kind of fit in with American exceptionalism, and that is that this is not who we are. That's right. You, you write about that. Oh, book. yes. This is not who we are. Yes, this is our, right. this is our modern trope. Whenever um, something happens yes. that, you know, we, we're disturbed by, you know, mm -hmm. if uh, there's, you know, on a, a, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, if, if soldiers urinate on corpses, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, as happened in 2012, or burn mm -hmm. up a bunch of Korans, mm -hmm. or, or can, you mm -hmm. know, kill 16 civilians uh, somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, one after another, American officials line up to say, right. you know, th this is regrettable and, and, and wrong, but that's not who we are. No, no. Well, it, it may not be who we all are or every day, but mm -hmm. it is a part of who we are, yeah. you know, because these things go on and on and on, and yeah. uh, we're responsible for them. You can't just say that's it's not us. Right. They always want to treat it as an aberration. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And they do. Single. And one of the things that, that Chris does so well in, in his first book, Working Class War, yeah. is, is he talks about the doctrine of atrocity, that, okay. you know, Milai was not an aberration. And in fact, Milai was a logical outcome in some ways of the, yeah. the tactics and the strategy that the U.S. employed in Vietnam, the search and yeah. destroy and the emphasis on body count and not being able to distinguish civilians mm -hmm. from combatants. It was inevitable that things like that were going to happen, maybe not to that scale. Yeah. And that really helped lay the groundwork for people like Nick Terse and others who came along later and really documented that mm -hmm. Milai was not an aberration. Mm -hmm. Milai, in a lot of ways, and that kind of terrorism, really, yeah. was a matter of policy in Vietnam. The, the title of uh, Terse's book, Kill Everything That Moves. Absolutely. Yeah, those those were the orders. Right? Yeah. That was life in a free fire zone, right. and that was life for Operation Speedy Express and all these other things. Yeah, but right. even today, when those things happen in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria, it's, oh, that's a few bad apples. Right. That's an aberration. Right. That's not, rather than saying, like, that is a logical outcome of the kind of wars we fight yeah. and how we fight right. them. And when you, yes, when, yeah. we, when you intervene, now, as we did, you know, 50 years ago in these countries where our soldiers are widely right. perceived as foreign uh, invaders or mm -hmm. occupiers at, at least, and, uh, you know, to prop up these regimes yep. in, in Kabul and Baghdad, as in Saigon, that don't, don't have the broad support of their own people, right. and you're waging a sort of brutal counter uh, uh, right. insurgency mm -hmm. against these, these same uh, hostile people, yes, it's a, it's a perfect recipe. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. for uh, civilian loss of civili you know, killing of civilians. Mm -hmm. Your title, Reckoning, and you know what I continually come back to, and because these events were such a sea change of thinking, intellectual, all the other knowledge movements you talked about, mm -hmm. and rights movements of this time, yet some of that was picked up as a new uh, uh, strand of mm -hmm. conservatism and, and mm -hmm. a whole um, upbringing of those, of those values in a different way. The reckoning word I always come back to because it still seems that we haven't really fully yeah. taken the responsibility, and that's you know a lot of what Agent Orange yeah. was about too. And it, maybe until we really do that, we we don't learn yeah. um, from that. And even if you know most in, you know intellectual folks would agree that this was a counter revolution. Yeah. That strand is still out there because it hasn't been fully sort of tackled, and we still hear the same rhetoric today. How do you reckon? Well, I, <laughs> that? I couldn't say it better than that. I, mean, I think that um, the process of a reckoning did begin yeah. in the war years, uh, and and uh, we've gone sort of back yeah. backwards uh, since. I mean, um, mm -hmm. there. You, you know, the, the level of um, self-analysis, national self-analysis, self-criticism right. was just so intense in that period, and we've never had anything close to right. it mm -hmm. uh, since. So, you know, in, in my mind, um, you know, we have to take on these big ideas that underwrite yeah. that sort of sense that we are uh, the greatest force for good in the world, which is a still a cliche that it seems, seem, you have to say it, I guess, to become president. Yes. Uh, or, or even, a, you know, a senator almost, <laughs> yes. you know. Uh, and, and that is kind of the classic statement of American exceptionalism. I mean, 
more people are starting to use the word imperialism, but yep. maybe that maybe that's a good thing. But now we even have defenders of it right. using it because and what they would say is, you know, well of if course. we don't do it, who is? And we that's just right. got to do it, you know, what better, <laughs> and yeah. more fully, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. put on the pith helmets and the jodhpurs and be like exactly. the great British <laughs> Empire, as his, you know, Neil Ferguson would say, yeah, <laughs> or resurrect Jefferson's term, exactly. Empire exactly. of Liberty, yeah, right? exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Let's focus on the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be the topic of your uh, Winnie the Easter Peace Lecture. And uh, having participated somewhat in that movement myself, I, I'm, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts about the anti-war movement uh, during Vietnam and uh, maybe some of the larger um, yeah. consequences of that movement. Well, the, the quick answer is I think it was the most dynamic and diverse anti-war movement in our history, though there have been anti-war movements for every war, which is not well-known, should mm -hmm. be. Uh, and uh, having said that, uh, that movement has been the, the subject of a campaign of uh, distortion mm -hmm. and vilification Absolutely. that has been extraordinarily effective. Mm -hmm. So that I think there are a lot of people who, you know, they wouldn't say it to your face maybe, but would say, oh, you were an anti-war activist. You, you, you were kind of a, a draft dodger who, who wanted to save your own skin. And not only that, you were really mean to American veterans when they right. came home. Mm -hmm. You know, right, you know, right. you called them bad names, and you might even have spat upon them. Right. I mean, that that has become pervasive yeah. in our public memory of the anti-war movement. Although there's absolutely movement. no evidence for and some of those well, things well, ever happening. You know, right. you know, every movement attracts some uh, some uh, yes. some jerky people who sure. do some nasty <laughs> things. That that that's mm -hmm. true. But you know, this idea that it was that there were uh, you widespread, know, yeah. you know, people just waiting at the airport to you know for, to to just to, to yeah. do that yeah. is crazy. Um, so that's that's kind of. Uh, what I'll, one of the things I'll, I'll try to argue is that at the same time you're, mm -hmm. you have the successful sort of demonization of mm -hmm. the movement, uh, you have the, um, a, 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 a related campaign to build up a kind of reflexive reverence for the, everybody who puts on the uniform mm -hmm. in, in military service of this country, both the, the troops, the active duty troops and mm -hmm. the, the veterans, yeah. and that they, they are, are conferred a kind of automatic hero status, and not only, and, and I would call them sort of hero victims, because we're all mm -hmm. supposed to always, that's what brings the two, the two ideas together, mm -hmm. that they, they were the victims of, yeah. of this home front um, betrayal by the anti-war mm -hmm. movement. Now, they, they were the victims of a certain kind of betrayal, I'd argue. I think the government and corporate America did not do nearly what it uh, was you know, sh uh, should have done in yeah. support of these homecoming troops. Um, but it, it is, is uh, um, that sort of, we, we must thank, above all, whatever else we do, we need to thank uh, our, our troops for their service, mm -hmm. uh, is a really, does really uh, chill and dampen mm -hmm. anti-war dissent. And we've had no, we, we have had no successful effort to rehabilitate mm -hmm. uh, a more positive view of the anti-war movement. It's staggering to me that uh, I can't think of a single major American public figure who has ever uh, made a, 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 an important mm. speech uh, talking about um, the historical um, mm -hmm. uh, greatness of, of that peace movement. And the way you hear of automatic, uh, often you'll hear mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, tributes to the civil rights movement uh, or, or other mm -hmm. pioneers. Um, you know, going back throughout our history, mm -hmm. the abolitionists, the suffragists, the labor activists, they, of course they were all um, uh, dis d criticized and even mm -hmm. attacked and even killed in their own time as were civil uh, rights activists. But, you know, with time, those, uh, the majority of Americans could see that they were on the right side of history yeah. and honor them to one, one degree. But we don't have yeah. a peace museum. We don't have peace highways. Right. We don't have a peace holidays. We don't, you know, yeah, it's, we don't mm -hmm. even have yeah. Hollywood movies that have anti-war yeah. activists uh, who, you know, play a kind of honorable, uh, respectable, uh, respectable yeah, role. Right? I mean, maybe yeah. way back, the movie Hair, maybe, yeah. um, maybe this movie Coming Home or Born on the Fourth of July, but they tend to well, have... Well, now the Pentagon Papers uh, came out, yes, okay, so okay, Well, that I haven't movie. seen that yet, so maybe, <laughs> maybe there's some hope there, but, uh, you know, I would have thought that maybe the Ken Fine Burns now. documentary uh, might have provided some yeah. of that, but one of the sh most shocking Thank aspects of it is that that the, the, the two people who were part of the anti-war movement who, who have given some time to talk yeah. mm -hmm. do as, as, spend as much time criticizing the anti-war movement as the war. 
and you know some of the veterans say some you know uh, good things against yes. the war there, but they have a military credential. You know? That's and right. That gives them yeah. the sort of the legitimacy yeah. to say, yes. uh, yeah, I came home and I joined the yes. anti-war movement. Or, or to focus as they did on Jane Fonda. Yes, uh, yes. exactly. Yes. 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 First of all, to flesh out Barbarella. Right. Yes. That's right. You know, and make yes. that right. make that the, yeah, the, the starting frame. Maharaji, it's then, a kind mm -hmm. of the old yeah. image of the betray the betrayer, the yes. betrayer. Oh, really. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thought that was the weakest part of the Burns film for sure, yeah. just that it did not do justice to the uh, to the anti-war movement. I mean, to me, I mean. A Catholic kid growing up in a Catholic yeah. high school, the Berrigans were heroes to us, right? Yeah. right. For the, the right. stand that and they now took. Unknown. Catonville. Mm -hmm. yeah. And no mention yeah. whatsoever of the Berrigans mm -hmm. in, yeah. in the film. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, yeah. Again. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the only public figure that I can think of that had to walk both those lines would be John Kerry. Yes. But because he, but he but tried he to have it both same, ways, right? Yeah. He wanted to be the war hero that's and right. the anti-war so hero. He, and then once he got attacked, he, he kind would, of went he backed off hole. of that. Yeah. I think that's maybe yeah. as close as we've ever gotten to having yeah. that in a public yeah, figure. That's a good, that's a good I'd be point. interested to go back to some of his speeches yeah. when he was running for president and see how he reframed that given what you just yeah. said. Yeah. The fact that veterans did play such a substantial role in the anti-war movement too, I think is, is important and also- Yeah, it shows that there were, about. you know, I think Americans for a long time, maybe t and still today, had this notion that there were two camps of that generation. The patriotic right. vets that, you know, was, went off and fought the war yeah. and these unpatriotic, if not, you know, <laughs> an American, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, college-based- uh, yeah. Hippies. Hippies, Those yeah, hippies. <laughs> uh, who, and, and, and never the twain should meet. In fact, there were a lot of kind of interesting yeah. uh, efforts to, to collaborate. I mean, there's a new book by a guy named David Parsons uh, called Dangerous mm -hmm. Grounds about the coffee house movement. This mm -hmm. was an effort of the civilian, what I call the civilian anti-war mm -hmm. movement, because the, they don't have military credentials, right. to go to these um, major military base towns, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Fort Hood and other places, mm -hmm. and, and, and open a little coffee house mm -hmm. and invite uh, active duty GIs mm -hmm. to come and listen to music and, and talk. And it became a kind of uh, uh, meeting ground uh, f and f that did nurture anti-war mm -hmm. dissent. And uh, so these, these connections, um, you know, there are more of them than you, you might imagine. Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, I, w one of the things that I'll try to get to tonight is I think that the, um, the, the anti-war movement did bring the, the war to a, 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 an end sooner than it might have. Yeah. I mean, it's not great consolation given the three million lives lost and how long it went on. Yeah. But, you know, it did get to the point where um, the military, I think, was pretty convinced that they didn't have a, an effective fighting force anymore because the disaffection and yeah. dissent and, uh, and desertion and combat refusals and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, were so intense in Vietnam mm -hmm. that um, they, you know, it's almost there used to be a bumper sticker that said, uh, "What if they give a war and no one shows up?" Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a slogan, and it seemed, you know, maybe at the time, hopelessly. Uh, mm -hmm. Na dreamy, you yeah. know, unre naive, you know, because of course the government will always have the power to, to, yeah. to field a, a, yeah. a force. But actually, by the end of the war, that, that bumper sticker actually spoke to a real uh, reality. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, uh, the, the anti war movement did have some effect. Mm -hmm. And I did, I, it was a check, too, even on Nixon, believe it or not, yeah. in, in a, a variety of ways. I mean, he did many monstrous things, but he yeah. might have done more. Yeah, yes. we didn't it really how. wore him down. The protesters out there, and he admits mm -hmm. it is a bit more that he didn't follow through on some yes. ultimatums in 1969 right, because yeah. of the uh, the uh, fall demonstrations. That's right. Uh, yeah. The moratorium, mm -hmm. the first one in particular. Uh, yeah. I'll say a little bit about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the role of uh, other major, respected, more mainstream people? I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin Spock, the baby doctor, speaking mm -hmm. out, uh, the Berrigan brothers, as I mentioned, yeah. the Catholic Church, Martin Luther yeah. King right. in 67. Yeah. Right, like then again, that, that's so important because it does challenge that sort of stereotype of the, the, the hippie as being the iconic right. anti-war mm -hmm. protester. I mean, it did, um, it did cut across um, race mm -hmm. and gender mm -hmm. and um, region mm -hmm. and religion. Every religious denomination had you know, a active participation. Yeah. Uh, in that movement, and it became increasingly mainstream. I mean, by the end, I mean, some people make the argument that that the fact I mean, Wall Street itself began to turn against the war, and that was, you know, very important uh, to 
uh, the, you know, uh, the establishment. Mm -hmm. My God, we, if we can't get the support of these people, you know, it really is over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, the, the famous line attributed to um, LBJ yeah. when Cronkite said that the war had uh, become a bloody uh, right. stalemate. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't see, you know, uh, an end to it. Uh, and LBJ supposedly turned to one of his aides and said, well, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah you're right. And that was 50 uh, years ago, right now. Ex yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Right after Almost the, to the yes. Well, after ten, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, two was the 29th today. 50 years yeah. ago, yes, two days from is. now, was oh, the boy. day that uh, Johnson famously went on TV mm -hmm. and announced, in part because of the power of the anti-war movement, yeah. that that he, the most ambitious American politician yes. maybe in our history, mm -hmm. was not going to uh, to run for re-election. Re Someone right. who had won. And, Election yeah. of '64 in a landslide, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I think honestly, who knows? You can't replay history, but had he withdrawn in, uh, before he escalated it in '64, '65, yeah. uh, he might well have been reelected uh, uh, e quite easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. What else you got? We have there? a. Uh, <laughs> I think the title of your talk. Uh, about the anti-war movement is why we, why don't we have a, a, a peace memorial? Yeah, yes. memorial. <laughs> yeah, I really like. So that. so, once you talk a little bit more about that, but also yes. what about the memorial memorial that we do have the wall uh, in mm, Washington D.C. Yeah, well, you know, one thing that occurred to me in, in preparing this lecture is that the the, the fact that it names every um, American soldier mm -hmm. that uh, died in the war. Um, really may have its origins in the anti-war movement because one of the things that was mm. a standard thing to do at a large public demonstration would be for individuals to, to come up one at a time, sometimes holding a candle or even the, uh, a little poster with the name mm -hmm. of a, an actual American soldier who died in Vietnam mm -hmm. and just to speak and sort of do witness to yeah. that loss of American life one after another. They were sometimes referred to as marches of death. And, and so that tribute, you know, oddly enough, uh, um, mm -hmm. may have come out of the anti-war movement. But of course, there are omissions on that, you know, that memorial. We don't have the names of, you yeah. know, the, the students who died at Kent State right. or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other people who, you know, the, uh, Americans would be shocked, I think, to, to know this, but I think nine Americans committed suicide in protest of the Vietnam War. So those are names mm -hmm. that might appear on a, a peace m memorial. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or the mm -hmm. some 82 Vietnamese, um, mm -hmm. mostly Buddhist, who immolated themselves. Right. Not just that, Not just that one. one with the famous picture. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, more than 80. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you listen, a, a memorial is not an answer to everything, but, it, you know, uh, a mm -hmm. peace museum, some sort of major cultural uh, acknowledgement mm -hmm. that, uh, and, uh, and uh, commemoration, I mean, uh, of anti-war activism, yeah. you know, would be enormously uh, healthy to our democracy. Yeah. We do that for the ones we won. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's true. Since we didn't win, we can't have yeah. a well. You know, can even, e but even a good, <laughs> and even a good anti-war right. uh, museum would would, would do, have this. Would would, uh, would talk about World War One too, yes, exactly. which you know was was not a popular right. war. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the aftermath, it was not, and and even during it, there was a lot of yeah, dissent. Yeah. Uh, and, and very draconian laws against dissent at the time. People got you know, uh, uh, put in prison or deported. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the shooting at Kent State, and I, I have to confess this is part of my own personal history in terms of connection to the anti-war mm -hmm. movement. Uh, I grew up in Ohio. Uh, I went to the University of Toledo, but my girlfriend, now my wife of 45 <laughs> years, uh, was a student at Kent State. She was a freshman that year. Mm. So I had been to Kent many times, <clears throat> and in fact, I was there the weekend when everything started. Wow. Although I wasn't involved in that at all, but I was there that weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, so it had a real personal connection to me that that line in the famous Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young song, you know, what if you knew one and found right. her dead on the ground? Yeah. I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks, right? right? Yeah. So, so how does Kent State play into the overall anti-war movement and, and what did it say about mm. this national identity crisis of students were being yeah. shot dead on American campuses yeah. protesting right. yeah. this very Oh, I think it was war. enormously yeah. important. And, uh, you know, there is a kind of, um, one, of the, one of the distortions of the anti-war movement is that it kind of ended at Kent State. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. and that was, but, yeah. in, but in fact, it regalvanized the yeah. movement and it brought in new kinds of people 
younger people, uh, high school students. Uh, mm -hmm. It had a huge impact, actually, on a lot of Vietnam veterans, mm -hmm. you know, who, 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 were, who were shocked, you know, which you wouldn't necessarily expect if, if you buy that idea that, you know, all veterans hated anti-war movements and vice right. versa. Yeah. But there was actually, a, the, the, many were terribly shocked by that and uh, took their first steps toward activism. Ron Kovic says so in, in Born on the Fourth yeah. of July. That's yeah. right, yeah. And Bill Earhart says it in his memoir. Yeah. Um, so there's, there is that. And um, yeah, I mean, it, was, it really did feel like the, you know, yeah, and of course it was, it was the middle of the broad daylight, a sunny day on a Heartland campus mm -hmm. and four, you know, white students. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. just something that, you know, no one would expect. Two of whom right. weren't even Two part weren't of even the protest, protest, right? Exactly. One was an Astro ROTC cadet, yeah. mm -hmm. happened to be standing right. around, yeah. and another mm -hmm. young woman just walking by at the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. No, I like what you said about, you know, we do always seem to find money for wars, but yeah, <laughs> right. very, you know, and we, a lot of the themes on this show that we talk about are some of the real sources of insecurity <laughs> or threats, mm -hmm. right? And, and let's, let's maybe put some money into peace um, right. instead of um, Well, you know, maybe, still, you know, the right? fact that now more and more campuses, uh, you know, uh, have peace studies, That's right. peace, mm -hmm. peace institutes could be at least the, the, yeah. the mm -hmm. to looking for something That's you right. know, optimistic, yeah. you know, that that could be a kind of... Um, Seed uh, bed uh, 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 for more of this kind of uh, yeah, uh, thinking, and there's a. I mean, I'm going to a conference in May out in Notre Dame, uh, which is yeah. a sort of a, they have a peace institute. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, so, so we had this enormous, important anti-war movement during Vietnam. Prior to the invasion of Iraq, there was a pretty substantial right. mm -hmm. protest even before the war starts. You know. Yeah, worldwide, amazing, worldwide unprecedented, protests worldwide protests of, protest. That's right. of 2002. Right. Yes. Kind of all falls apart once the actual yes. invasion begins. Right. And yeah. We don't really see mm -hmm. much of a substantial anti-war movement today. Yeah, that, uh, that, no. that remains a, a, a real mystery. Why mm -hmm. didn't it? Because it was mm -hmm. huge, millions of people you know, uh, to preempt a preemptive war, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, once the, right, once, once it started, it, it does sort of fall back into its uh, usual places where That's you right. might expect to see it, you know, mostly internet <laughs> yeah. sites mm -hmm. and, or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but not loud public. And, you know, yeah. I think it may be true that some people would say, well, you know, loud public demonstrations really don't have that much of an impact on public opinion. Mm -hmm. There are other, mm -hmm. there are other strategies. Well, I'm open mm -hmm. to that, but I just haven't seen a lot of evidence uh, yeah. of you know, intense door-to-door -door canvassing or that kind of thing. I mean, I think, right. you know, we, one thing to note is that we do have a lot of anti-war opinion. Uh, if you look mm -hmm. at the polls, mm -hmm. uh, since 2006, the majority of Americans right. have thought that we should get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. But we don't, unlike the 60s, right. have a, a, a deep and vibrant anti-war movement or culture. You know, mm -hmm. those, that's, that's an important uh, difference. Yeah. And, you know, I, a lot of people say to me, you know, uh, that, oh, it's because we don't have the draft. If you bring back the, the draft, you're going to reestablish mm. that. And, you know, there may be something mm. to that, but one of the distortions of memory is that, uh, about the 1960s, is that, you know, the reason that people are out in the streets is because of, you know, that the, they were worried about the draft, mm. that they're saving their own skin. But, in fact, a lot of the people that were involved in the anti movement had uh, mm -hmm. student deferments or exemptions, and they were spending countless mm -hmm. hours anyway mm -hmm. because out of moral fervor yeah. and out, out of a, a 1960s view that did persist, mm -hmm. even though there was a lot of demoralization, this idea that citizens can make a difference, that's citizens right. can mm -hmm. change things. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a bigger difference. I think now mm -hmm. in our 21st century, there's just deeper cynicism about the possibility that ordinary people can have any effect on what seems like mm -hmm. a permanent and impervious uh, war machine uh, that is out yeah. of control, that can't be controlled. Yeah. Um, so overcoming that yeah. and, um, you know, is the real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, but, and yet at the same time, a bit of a protest culture and movement is back. Yes, so, so I do take other, hope, yes, uh, in some areas, of these other things. Yes, uh, I mean, right? you've, you've, you're involved in climate, uh, so you know, the, climate the, marches, the global the climate marches. justice movement is, uh, is, I mean, if these things started to come together when you think about exactly. it, you know, Black Lives Matter and now this you know, March for Our Lives right. uh, and the anti-nuclear movement Me too. and, uh, you the, know, other, the, yes, the Me Too movement, because mm -hmm. there, there are common 
they realities really are. between them yeah. in, in the way we invest our, our money and yeah. our resources mm -hmm. and the way we act in the world. I mean, even in environmental issues, I mean, who's yeah, the biggest so user of fossil fuels? The military. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And the Pentagon recognizes climate change, but, but what's their answer to yeah. I mean, it's it's more militarization? It's more military the way to, to adapt, protect right? our so. specialness. Yeah. Still. So, yeah. so is part of the problem that we're facing that the that American exceptionalism was rebuilt or reestablished in some way, shape, or form yeah. after this, yeah. that there certainly yeah, was a right-wing yeah. rest restoration yeah. project. Yes, and it's still there because you know, uh, right. um, and it's, it's, a little, uh, it's a little bit mysterious too, because if, if you ask mm -hmm. uh, Americans, do you believe that we're the greatest country in the world, still a big majority would say yes, yes. I, believe, I believe in American exceptionalism. But if you ask America, it's not like we don't have a capacity for self-criticism, uh, at least mm -hmm. on specific issues, because if you poll Americans about mm -hmm. the schools, you know, they, right. many, many criticisms. What about our uh, infrastructure? Right. Oh, you know, it's right. you know, C minus or D, you know, whatever. What about Congress? 6% mm -hmm. approval rate. Exactly. <laughs> you know, all this other stuff. Yes. But then you say, what about um, American exceptionalism? Well, if it weren't for us, all hell would break loose. Right. You know, anarchy would reign. We are we, we we are needed. We need to be the policemen of the world because who else who else would do it? Right. Even though they might also admit that the way we've policed Iraq yeah. and Iran hasn't worked, or in, in fact has produced blowback. you know more yeah. chaos right. and more yeah. blowback and more yeah. displaced people and refugees. You know all these crises. That's right. yeah. But I, we still seem to hang on to this idea that mm. uh, we uh, we have to do it. It's our responsibility. Yeah. Um, and that, that is American exceptionalism, as tattered as it is. Mm -hmm. Tattered as it is. All right, now I have to ask you, what about Donald Trump? Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, everything that we, we set up to this point <laughs> would be true, yeah. would be true without yes. Donald Trump entering yeah. the political scene. But mm -hmm. now that Donald Trump has entered the political scene, yes. Yes. What's your analysis of Trump? Yeah. And of course, now even more frightening news that John Bolton yes. is going to come in, yes. uh, National well, Security you know, Advisor. Mm -hmm. I'll, Almost every good analysis de depends on a, on a subject that, that has some rhyme or reason, that has some structure uh, or some uh, underlying uh, uh, tangible, you know, uh, you know uh, behavior, behavior, predictable yeah, I mean, behavior. The guy is such a loose cannon, he almost defies any interpretation. Yeah. And he's not even a conventional American uh, a practitioner of American uh, empire. I mean, He's, he's, he drives these people crazy when yep. he, when he, you know, uh, criticizes NATO or, mm -hmm. or you know, s says good things ab uh, mm -hmm. about Putin and mm -hmm. you know, uh, or, or whatever it is, okay. or you yeah. know, flip flops on uh, North yeah. Korea. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. Right after he was elected, we had a thing at uh, uh, UMass uh, Amherst, our department sponsored a kind of. Uh, event mm. where a bunch of us uh, on the history department uh, sort of talked about the meaning of the election. Mm -hmm. And I found myself that, that, at that point saying that, well, you know, actually as, as uh, unusual as tr it is to have a reality TV show, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, host uh, become president of the United States and all the other things that make him unusual, it's not completely unprecedented. I mean, he says mm -hmm. things publicly that Nixon said in private, and da 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 da. da. I was trying to sh show that there's, you know, there's nothing, n nothing is ever mm -hmm. completely unprecedented. That's what historians are paid to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what I thought was my obligation. Plus, I thought it would calm some nerves. You know, yeah. that we can, we can, we can survive this. We survive <laughs> Nixon. We survive yeah. Reagan. You right. know, even yeah. George W. Bush, or Hancock, uh, could not be, you know, right. uh, supplanted by anybody more bizarre. But uh, so I've now concluded that. That he is, in fact, in, in many ways, completely uh, sui generis, it's, it's un 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 unprecedented. You know, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, it um, it does kind of devi defy mm -hmm. uh, it, analysis. Uh, other than uh, and, uh, you know, uh, other than that, we pay so much attention to him. You know, we move from day to day to day, mm -hmm. and that seems almost by design. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's the mistake. Well, mm -hmm. I think more and more people are coming to this conclusion. You know, stop. Uh, showing him, That's right. uh, you know, as uh, Tom Englehart posted the other day on his blog, uh, Tom Dispatch, 
uh, he he's calls him the Ford Bronco presidency because, you know, remember how obsessively we followed yes. O.J. Mm -hmm. Simpson, you know, for hours yes. as he's in this mm -hmm. Ford Bronco, even though there was no news to, no news to report. That's the way we kind of yeah. track mm -hmm. Donald Trump. What's the mm -hmm. next crazy thing he's going to tweet instead of paying attention to uh, climate change right. and mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. kids are still being, unarmed kids are right. still being killed by cops and, exactly. you know, all these other mm -hmm. things that are, uh, yeah. you know, going on. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Part of what's interesting, I think, though, to bring it back to American exceptionalism is how that plays out because there's so many contradictions. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's what the campaign kind of became about, right? You had the Make America Great Again hats and you had all these people who were like, love America, America first, but America's abandoned me. And they didn't quite put it that way, but that's essentially what they were saying, like white, rural, working class Americans, those kind of things. And then the response from Hillary is, oh, we're already great. Don't you yeah. know? We're already great. Why do you hate America? You know, right. we're great already. And I couldn't move me on that. But it's definitely not the kind of idealistic out in the world again. You know, most of those hardcore Trump voters, the 25, 28 percent right. who are going to vote for him, right. even if he does shoot right. someone we do in need square. a square. Yeah, I think right? we need a new, uh, someone who will uh, espouse a new form of internationalism. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a positive form of globalization. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, not the corporate model. Right. And, you know, not, not the, yeah. mm -hmm. and, you know, which would counter a lot of Trump's sort of, uh, you know, put up a wall mentality mm -hmm. or, um, yeah. you know, Obama was more subtle wars. about it, but there was no yeah, coherent right. vision to it either. Yeah, he had some right. elements and promise, yeah. but, yeah. you know, it didn't never take quite far. Yeah. But, but I think your point about Hillary is well taken. Still no politician can give yeah. up this idea of American no. exceptionalism. And I think deep down the rest of us yeah. that get that uh, know that that's also not true, right? And mm -hmm. not a valid thing that we can get our hearts and minds. Right. Uh, behind, and so you see a very uh, reactionary populist yeah. trend uh, right. taking that right. uh, that back over. So right. I think we can get along better with the rest of the world if, if we consider ourselves a nation among nations. Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's you know, American exceptionalism is not not only contrary to our historical record, That's but right. it alienates uh, the rest of the world who wants to be told they're uh, inferior. Right. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we continue to believe it, I think it does contribute to a kind of uh, uh, acquiescence yes. uh, to this, this, you know, these leaders that continue to do a certain military power without congressional, yeah. you know, real congressional authorization. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. never mind a, a public input exactly. from an informed public. So the imperial presidency yes. 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 survives yes. and, and yes. flourishes. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the optimistic ways that I try to think about uh, what you just said and, and Trump uh, is that this is the last gasp, perhaps, <laughs> of that lineage of American exceptionalism, post-Vietnam, that conservative movement, rise, the Reagan, uh, everything that's been done by the neocons to get to this point. Uh, because I would hope that this is now the time where I see many students and scholars and regular Americans looking at the kind of questions Good. that you ask. Good. What are the other stories out there? Why would well, someone vote for Trump? Mm -hmm. Like That's the most common question I got when I was overseas and that I get from students yeah. now. Like, who are these people and why do they think the way they do? Rather than focusing on Trump, right? It absolutely is an aberration. Uh, these other stories you're talking about are the underbelly of all of that and they're really important for us to get out, yeah. I feel like. And unfortunately, and we're out of time. I knew today. it. I knew he was giving Chris, me the thank bucket. you so much for <laughs> being yeah. on the show. Uh, I highly recommend people get a hold of American Reckoning. Great, great book. Thanks. Ed, thanks for coming back again. Thank Always you. happy yeah. to We might be just here. make you a regular here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we'd like to thank you for joining us on Critical Issues, Alternative Views. Thank you.